Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome to my Dan Hung and Bybiter Lunae guide. And Bybiter Lunae is an awesome hyper carry who I've been really excited for since first seeing him. As a DPS who can do a ton of damage, although he is one that requires a specific team, playstyle, and build to really get the most value out of, which are things that I'm going to explain in depth in this video. Because of that, I'm going to be covering everything you need to know about Bybiter Lunae, our newest five star DPS, so that you can get the most value out of him. Before we begin, do excuse my occasional wrong pronunciations of Bybiter, as I kind of learned mid video. And so with that said, let's get right into it. All right, so starting things off, what does Imbibitor Lunae actually do? Well, this character is very clearly a hyper carry who consumes a lot of skill points to enhance his very unique normal attacks, which will do more damage and have unique effects and buffs based on how many skill points you consume, ranging from one to three. If you just do a normal basic attack, it won't do much, but what your skill does is every time you press it, it will enhance your basic attack, as I said, one to three times, giving you a ton of buffs and a different unique effect. In fact, your normal basic attack will do two hits of damage. If you buff it once it will do three if you buff it twice it will do five and if you buff it three times costing three skill points it will do seven these last two are particularly important as they also come with additional buffs giving you another instance of imaginary damage from your fourth hit onwards to adjacent enemies whereas the initial hits from your basic attack will be single target you also do get a lot of buffs from your enhanced basic attacks notably the last few hits you're doing through your skill itself which will give you stacks of crit damage before every hit starting from the fourth hit meaning that when you do a level two or level three three basic attack, consuming either two or three skill points respectively, you will gain either two or four stacks of crit damage. In fact, if you fully max this trace, it will give you 12% crit damage per stack, and these stacks will ramp up with every hit you do, starting with your fourth one, ramping up to a total of 24% crit damage if you do a level two basic, and 48% if you do a level three one, meaning that your hits get stronger and stronger. Now, similarly to this ramping crit damage buff, your talent, your passive talent, will also give you a ramping amount of just straight damage percent, again, being quite a lot. 10% when fully maxed per stack, stacking up to six times with your Imbibitor Lune getting one stack after every hit unleashed. Because of this, if you stack up your normal attack to level three, every attack you do after your first one will gain 10% damage, scaling from 10 to 60 and expiring at the end of the turn. And so because of your talent and your skill and also what your normal attack does in general when you do level it up all the way is actually going to make your basic attacks do an insane amount of damage, mostly to a single target, but also having a nice bonus amount of AOE sort of splash damage to the two adjacent targets, making his basic attacks very powerful, especially if you can get a level 3-1 consistently. Keep in mind that the buffs we talked about, like your talent, are those that are buffed with each hit, not each attack. So when you do, let's say, a level 3 enhanced basic attack, since you're attacking 7 times, you will be able to fully stack this talent, as after every hit, you will gain 1 stack, with this talent, once again, stacking on each hit that you're doing. Moving on for Dan Hung Il's ultimate, this is going to be a 3-hit attack, with a pretty high scaling that will be single target damage, while also having a bit smaller AOE damage to the two adjacent targets as a nice amount of bonus imaginary damage. Now, the best part of this ultimate, though, in my opinion, is that you get two Squama stacks for free when you use it, which are basically two free skill points. In fact, you can get up to three Squama stacks, and each Squama stack you have can effectively be consumed instead of a skill point when you use your skill and enhance your basic attack, meaning that after you use your ultimate, if you press your skill three times, it will only consume one skill point and two Squama stacks, allowing you to use your enhanced level three basic attack without needing more than one skill point. This makes it to where your Imbibitor Lunae can be a bit less skill point hungry, despite still needing as many skill points as you can give him. These Squama stacks, as I said, they act like skill points, but only for Dan Hung. He's obviously the only one that can use them, and they are displayed under your Dan Hung's character icon in the bottom left of your screen as a visual indication of how many you have. Other important things to note are that Imbibitor Lunae's minor traces, you get a lot of imaginary damage and also crit rate, which can make him a lot easier to build and just stronger even at a baseline. For your major traces, you get some crowd control resist, 15 energy at the start of the battle, and also also 24% crit rate against imaginary weak enemies, which is just a really nice bonus, especially if you're running him with someone like Silverwolf, who can implant an imaginary weakness, or just obviously if you're fighting an imaginary weak enemy. Keep in mind that since your ultimate is a three-hit multi-hit attack, you can actually get some stacks of your Righteous Heart talent, which will increase its damage progressively. For your trace priority, you do want to be leveling your basic attacks first, as these represent the scaling of your actual enhanced basic attacks themselves, and then after that, your other three talents are pretty similar in value. With your ultimate and your talent, typically being a bit more important to level than your skill. Also, for Lunae's technique, he has a really unique and strong one where, first of all, you enter a leaping dragon state for 20 seconds where every time you attack, you dash forward, allowing you to move around the map very rapidly if you want that for exploration, while also being a great way to enter combat and typically how I recommend entering combat with this character, as not only will you deal imaginary damage to every enemy, you'll also gain one Squama stack, which is the stacks you gain when using your ultimate, effectively a free skill point, allowing you to start the combat with plus one skill point and make your gameplay 
and rotations a bit smoother. This is definitely one of my favorite techniques overall, being convenient outside of combat and also for initiating it. And so Ambiber Lunay is a very unique but powerful hyper carry. He is someone who very clearly will want to spam his level 3 enhanced basic attacks, which are very powerful alongside his ultimate thanks to all of the buffs you're getting, an amazing single target with a decent amount of adjacent splash damage that you can consistently dish out. With that said, while Dan Hong's third normal attacks are optimal and typically what you want to be doing, like the level 3 ones are just really strong, I do also want to admit that he is very skill point hungry and the team that you're running, how skill point efficient your team is, and many, many factors, like even the enemies you're fighting and if one of your allies gets like detained and you need to cleanse, anything like that that can happen can offset your skill point management and make you need to do one or even multiple level 2 basics instead of a level 3 one. This is typically fine. It's okay to do level 2 or even level 0 basic attacks from time to time to manage your skill points better depending on the situation. Although Dan Hung Il's best rotations when played in optimal teams do involve him using his level 3 basic attack as often as you can. I do want to make it clear that his level 2 basic attacks are fine to use and pretty strong as well, but a lot of his most skill point efficient teams, like for example running Ting Yun, Pila, and Luocha, provided all of your characters are just spamming basic attacks with your Ting Yun using your skill once every 3 turns and running relics and a light cone that can give her energy, like meshing cogs, Von Wack, and an ERR rope, can allow your dead hung to use his level 3 basic attack as often as possible while also getting his ult up every 3 turns, or sometimes every 2 if you have things like a signature light cone and or Ting Yun's 6th Eidolon, but again, there's like a lot of variables here to where giving an exact rotation where everything goes perfectly is something that I want to do, but also is something that isn't the most realistic as it will change from situation to situation. Keep in mind that you want a skill point efficient team, and with that and with a efficient energy generating Ting Yun, you can typically manage to ult every 3 turns, get a lot of skill points, and be skill point efficient if all of your characters are basic attacking, allowing your Dan Hung and Baibadur Lune to spam his level 3 basics. But as I said, if something goes wrong, if you have to use Pila's skill to remove a buff on an enemy, you have to heal with your healer, anything like that, it's okay if you also have to weave in some level 2 basics, or even in certain situations, just doing a purely non-enhanced basic attack to finish off a low health enemy to sort of save your skill points and generate one for your next rotation, that can be fine as well. Doing a level 0 basic can actually be useful to just gain a skill point instead of consuming some to allow you to level 3 normal in the coming turns if you need help managing your skill points. Because of this, I believe that when played correctly and built correctly in a proper team, Dan Hung and Baibadur Lune can be a very strong carry, whereas if you don't know how to play him, he can feel a lot worse and arguably inconsistent, despite this not really being true in my opinion, with his biggest drawback just being that he has restrictive teams and you do need to know how to manage your skill points. Also, a pretty important tip I wanted to mention is that generally when you use your ultimate, you want to do so after a level 3 enhanced basic attack, using your ultimate within the same turn so that you keep all of the buffs that your Dan Hung Il will get from using his level 3 basic. These buffs expire at the end of the turn, but if you use your ultimate within the same turn, right after your attack, then you will still have the buffs as you can see here, which will increase your ultimate's damage. Alright, now with that out of the way, let's move on to how you want to actually build this character to get the most value out of him, starting with his light cones. Well, the first thing I want to say regarding Dan Hong's light cones is that he actually has an amazing free to play option that's honestly comparable to his best in slot and a really, really strong option being the on the fall of Aeon that you can get and superimpose for free in Herda's simulated universe store. You can buy this light cone, buy some superimposers, get it to S5, and then get not just a good amount of base stats, but also an effect that will give you a bunch of attack percent, 16% when you attack, stacking up to four times for a maximum of 64% attack at superimposition level five, which again, you can get for free while also giving you 24% damage for two turns if you weakness break an enemy. This is something that you can do relatively easily, but it can be a bit inconsistent, I guess, depending on the enemy you're fighting. But as long as you can weakness break a single enemy, you'll get this damage bonus on top of the consistent part of this effect, which is 16 to 64% attack, making it just an insane option. Obviously, its value will depend on how consistently you can proc its second part, but just in general, in basically any situation, this light cone is absolutely insane and one that I highly, highly recommend getting and superimposing for your Dan Hung. It's your best free-to-play option and your second best option overall, being only a little bit behind his signature light cone, which is the next one we're going to talk about. While I don't necessarily recommend pulling for it, especially because there is such a great free-to-play option, Dan Hung's signature light cone, Brighter Than the Sun, is his general best in slot as it'll give you 18% crit rate as well as up to 36% attack and 12% energy recharge on its effect at S1 after you basic attack two times. Do keep in mind that I think an underrated part of this light cone is the energy regen you're getting, which can allow you to consistently get a three turn ultimate. However, if you're running him with Ting Yun, this typically isn't a problem anyways. But if you have both this light cone and Ting Yun, especially with her Eidolons, you can actually potentially manage to get your ult every two turns, which obviously is even better. So this light cone does have more value than just the like five to 10% damage 
and DPS increase, as the energy that you get is also something to keep in mind. And so it is your overall best slot. Outside of Lycone, as I mentioned, I do recommend On the Fall of an Aeon, but there are some other good options that I can recommend as well. Like notably Under the Blue Sky, especially with super impositions, with this Lycone being notable because it gives you a lot of attack and crit rate. But keep in mind that you do need to defeat an enemy to be able to get this 24% crit rate at super position level 5 or 12% at S1. So it can be a little bit less consistent. Clara's Lycone, which is about as good, and a 5 star that you may already have, or even Arlen's Lycone, notably if it is superimposed. Also, the Battle Pass Lycone, Nowhere to Run, can be a viable option as well for pretty high base stats for a 4 star Lycone, while also giving you 24% attack at S1 and an effect that will heal you when you defeat an enemy, which can be a comfy and valuable passive if you value the self healing to give your Dan Hung a bit more survivability. With that in mind, it's not going to be the strongest option when compared to some of the others that I mentioned because it doesn't give you like damage percent or anything, but the base stats are pretty high and the passive is quite comfy, so not the best DPS option, but a viable and comfy one that I wanted to at least mention. Now, moving on for Dan Hung Ill's best relics, there are two main sets that you could go for either the four piece of the Wasteland set, which is the imaginary damage set, or the four piece of the Musketeer. The way these sets work is that the four piece of the Wastelander set is going to be your best in slot if you can make use of its effect, as well the two piece gives you a straightforward 10% imaginary damage. The four piece will then give you more stats under certain conditions, 10% crit rate when you attack debuffed enemies, and 20% crit damage against imprisoned enemies. Because of this, in order to fulfill the conditions of the set, you would typically want to run a debuffing support with your Dan Hung Ill to get the 10% crit rate, which you're typically going to be doing anyway. Someone like Pila or Silverwolf are just some examples of characters that can debuff and have good synergy with Dan Hung anyways. And then the second part of the effect will be against imprisoned enemies, which you can do easily if the enemies you're fighting have an imaginary weakness, as Dan Hung Ill's weakness break is pretty good. So you can just weakness break or implant an imaginary weakness with someone like Silverwolf and get this 20% crit damage against those imprisoned enemies. If you can fulfill every condition of the set, then it will be your best slot. And just in general, it's pretty good. But keep in mind that for a more consistent option, a set that's not too far behind is going to be the Musketeer of the Wild Wheat, which is a generalistic option that you may already have farmed, which is also a great early game set as well as one that you get through many different sources. This set will give you 12% attack on the two beasts and then some speed and basic attack damage as well on the four piece, giving you just a ton of stats that your Dan Hung Ill will want, especially when you factor in how much basic attack damage this character actually deals. The difference between Musketeer and the imaginary set Wasteland is really not that high, so I typically recommend going based on whichever set you have that has better substats, with Wastelander being better if you can debuff and imprison the enemies, because the stats you gain here are pretty insane. As long as you can consistently debuff enemies, I do like the set, with the Musketeer being a more generalistic and sometimes consistent option as well, with both of them being great options overall. Keep in mind, you can also mix and match two pieces of any of these sets or also the messaging traveler set once again picking the ones that you already have farmed and have the better substats on moving on for your planner ornaments generally speaking go for the ruinland arena set if you can manage to get 70 percent crit rate as the payoff is very high giving you 20 percent basic attack and skill damage which for dan hung ill this means that your basic attacks however enhanced they may be will do a lot more damage on top of gaining eight percent crit rate for free making this generally speaking just your best option now keep in mind that while 70 percent crit rate can be hard to get at times you do get some crit rate from your traces, and you can also get more either from a signature Lycone if you choose to get it, or by just running a crit rate main stat body, which gives you a lot for free. Now, you can manage to get enough crit rate from your substats, traces, and the 8% that you get here without even needing a main stat body, but this can be a bit harder. And for a lot of people, you can always just go for a crit rate main stat to ensure that you get 70% crit rate for the set in order to get this 20% increase in basic attack damage on top of the 8% crit rate that you're already getting. Keep in mind that if you're running the Wastelander set, the 10% increased crit rate against against debuffed enemies won't apply towards the Rudolent Arena set effect, so you'll still need 70% crit rate without factoring in this bonus 10. The same applies with your bonus trace Jolt Anew, which gives you more crit rate against imaginary weakness enemies, again, not contributing towards the set effect. With that in mind, other options that aren't too far behind if you have better substats on them are the Space Stealing Station for 24% attack if you have 120 speed or more, or even the Inert Cell Soto set for 15% ultimate damage and also 8% crit rate, with this set only wanting 50% crit rate, which is obviously quite a bit less than the 70% if you don't have enough yet. Overall though, I do recommend going for the Rudolent Arena as a pretty efficient simulated universe world to farm anyways, and your best in slot overall. All right, now moving on for the main stats you want on Dan Hung Ill, it should be pretty straightforward as he is a relatively generic carry when it comes to the stats you want. What I mean by that is you typically want to be looking for crit rate and crit damage as your best options for your personal damage while also valuing stats like attack percent and speed. Now, the first thing I want to mention is regarding speed's value on Dan Hung Ill, and as with most carries, being able to go more and get to go twice in a cycle or move before your enemies and get as many turns in as possible, obviously that will typically mean more damage. A concern that a lot of people have is regarding Dan Hung Il's skill points. And while I covered this early in the video, what you need to understand is that if you're playing
playing Denhung ill properly, building correct teams around him, and are managing your skill points efficiently, while there isn't the most wiggle room and you don't really have many spare skill points, you will have enough to be able to fully maximize your Denhung ill's basic attacks, even if your Denhung ill is fast. While yes, you will be going more, meaning you'll consume more skill points, what is typically going to be optimal is usually running speed on him, but also running speed on your support characters so that they can keep up with him. Now, I do understand that this can be a bit more expensive. It can be a bit more quote unquote try hard. And yeah, it will require you to also run speedy supports so that all of your team can move fast, generate more skill points and just go more often. Whereas if your Dan Hung Il is your only fast character, then you'll be moving more and consuming more skill points. Also, while I don't know if I should put this here or in the team section of this video, I do want to at least mention that you need to be mindful of your other characters speed levels as well. Like you want your support characters to move typically before Dan Hung and Baibiru Lune. For example, you want Ting Yun and Pila to either buff you or debuff enemies respectively before you do your big attacks on your hyper carry. Alternatively, if you're using someone like Branya, who will cover whether or not you should in the team section, you would want her to be one less speed than your Imbiber Lune to move right after him and effectively give him an extra turn if you have the skill points to do so. So generally, while yes, you want speed on Imbiber Lune, as speed is just great to have in general, and 134 can be a nice breakpoint to move twice in the first cycle, you do also want to make sure that your support characters are speedy as well, and you balance and speed tune your team accordingly, depending on who you're playing. And so because of this, for your boots, speed is typically going to be the more optimal option, at least till you have enough to hit certain speed breakpoints, like 134 or whatever you're going for, to get as many turns in as possible, provided you have enough skill points to make it worth it, which is notably achievable by having enough speed on your supports as well. With that in mind, I know a lot of people will prefer just going for attack percent. It can be comfier, like easier to use. You don't have to think too much about it. Any slow down hung ill can be, as I said, easier to manage your skill points on, but it won't always be as efficient. Generally speaking, both speed and attack percent are viable though. You can go based on what play style you prefer and also especially based on your substats. Outside of that, it is very straightforward though. For your body, you want either crit rate or crit damage, with crit rate being very convenient to make sure you have 70% for your rule and arena set. But if you already have enough, then crit damage is also viable. Imaginary damage bonus on your sphere and attack percent on your rope. These will typically be the best options. And if you're wondering, an ERR rope, while it can have its uses, typically won't be as good as attack percent as a lot of Dan Hung Il's damage does come from his basics. So you won't really want to get as much attack and crit as possible, more so than just energy. For Dan Hung Il's Eidolons, he's actually someone who does have quite a few good ones, despite also just being amazing at E0. First of all, his first Eidolon will give you more Righteous Heart stacks, increasing the max amount to four and allow it to ramp up faster, giving you some more damage. And while this Eidolon is decent, it's more damage, it's usually a stepping stone towards the second one, which is quite insane. And then his second Eidolon is the first pretty big and good one, which will basically make it to where every time your Dan Hung uses his ultimate, he will instantly go again and be able to use a level three normal attack for free. In fact, after using your ultimate, instead of getting two Squama stacks, so basically two skill points, it will now be three. He'll get an extra one while also advancing your action forward by 100%, meaning you effectively get to go again right after ulting, giving you another turn and making it a very strong second Eidolon. Moving on, your third and fifth Eidolons will level up your traces as with every character. Your fourth Eidolon will increase the duration of your dominating roar buff. Are the crit damage stacks you gain from normal attacking that usually expire right after your turn, but now will last a bit longer, meaning you can have that increased crit damage for your ultimate or just for all of your hits on your next turn. Next up, your sixth Eidolon is another really huge one. Honestly, this one will give you some imaginary resistance pen to your Invivitor Lunae's next attack every time another ally uses an ultimate. You get 20% of this per ultimate and it stacks up to three times for a total of 60% imaginary resistance pen, which is honestly pretty huge to increasing your Invivitor's personal damage as ignoring imaginary res is just great, especially against enemies with higher resistances and that are just higher leveled. Because of that, while Den Hung is a great carry at E0, and I don't want anyone to feel forced to pull for Eidolons, I do want to say that your second and sixth Eidolon are definitely going to be your two best ones, with your second one being a nice early stopping point if you choose to pull for some Eidolons. All right, now moving on, let's talk about how to build an Imbibitor Lune team, which is going to be one of the most important sections, but also a pretty straightforward one. Generally speaking, for Imbibitor Lune, to get a lot of value out of him, you want to make sure that you are maximizing your skill point generation and being efficient with how you spend them. Because of this, you want supportive characters alongside your Imbibitor who don't consume a lot of skill points. Skill point efficient characters, specifically supports, who can either buff your Imbibitor or debuff enemies enemies, give you some utility, and also allow you to do a fully stacked normal attack with three skill points available. And so because of this, the characters that he synergizes with are those who fit the categories that I mentioned, being supports that are very skill point efficient and who can synergize well with your Imbibitor. One of the best examples of this is Ting Yun, who's going to be the premier buffer and harmony support for Imbibitor Lune as a character who only needs to use her skill once every three turns, as it lasts for three turns and gives you a ton of attack, while also giving you some energy and damage through her ult, allowing for your 
Dan Hung to ult more often and consistently get it off every three turns, while also having some other upsides, like being able to run a supportive light cone and having a non-useless basic attack thanks to some of her traces, being able to use your skill once every three turns and then generate two skill points from basic attacking, making her a very, very efficient character and generally the best harmony support to run alongside your Dan Hung in Bybiter Lune. Outside of Ting Yun though, there are also some other really good options like Yukong, who is one that can require a bit more speed tuning and knowledge to play, but she can actually get a lot of value on your team if you basic attack with her and try to be pretty skill point efficient, using your skill right before you use your ult, making sure that she goes right before your Imbibitor Lune, who will get all of the buffs, on top of being able to run a light cone like the Planetary Rendezvous and have a trace that will increase your imaginary damage. She can therefore be pretty efficient at buffing your Imbibitor, although you have to be mindful of how you're using your skill, and she is also someone who will get better with Eidolons, which I'd rank like right behind Ting Yun, whose energy, in my opinion, is invaluable. Another harmony option that I believe is very underrated is actually Asta, who can be a decent option, especially if you have some of her later Eidolons, like her fourth and sixth one, and the meshing Cogs like Cone. She can get a pretty good uptime on her attack buff while also giving you speed and being a pretty useful harmony support. Now, regarding Bronya, while I first want to start by saying that Bronya very clearly will have better synergy with some other characters, she can definitely work with your Imbibitor Lude, but only if you're playing them correctly, and it does require you to be mindful of your rotation and what exactly you're doing. Since Bronya gives you effectively an extra turn instantly, you won't have enough skill points to do, for example, two level three basics in a row on your Imbibitor Lune. With that in mind, you can do something like doing a level zero basic on your Dan Hung, then using your Bronya skill so that he goes again instantly, and then can do a level three fully buffed basic attack on top of his ultimate, if you can fit that in there, which can be efficient because Bronya gives you a lot of damage on her skill and a ton of crit damage and attack through her ultimate. She also has traces that'll just give you more damage and overall is a great buffer to where even if she does have a lot of negative synergy with your Imbibitor Lune, she can still work. It will just require you to play a very specific rotation and also make sure that your Bronya is at least one speed slower than your Imbibitor. With that said, I do think that her synergy here is a lot worse than with other characters where another carry would be able to do their max amount of damage twice in a row, but she can definitely still be a strong option here because of how broken Bronya is. Now, outside of that slot, the other two characters are typically going to be either another buffer or a debuffer. Typically, I recommend a Nihility support like either Pila or Pella or Silverwolf, both of which kind of fulfilling a similar role. Silverwolf gives you a lot more defense reduction and debuffs as a whole, but they're more single target and she's also a five star. While also being pretty skill point efficient, you can implant a weakness with your skill, which costs one skill point, and then basic attack and still apply bugs onto enemies, while also having a massive defense tread with her ultimate. Pila, on the other hand, is more AoE and also free to play friendly, and someone who is also very, very skill point efficient, as her big death shred comes from her ultimate, which obviously doesn't cost any skill points. You can then spam normal attacks or use your skill if you need to, to remove an enemy's buff, giving her a lot of utility and increasing your damage. You can also run the Silver Wolf event light cone we got a few patches ago, which will give her energy, allowing her to have better uptime on her ult, as its defense reduction will last for two turns. And so you can run either Pila or Silver Wolf, depending on who you have and kind of which one you'll be using in your other team. And do note that Silver Wolf can also enable some mono imaginary teams or just teams where you can implant imaginary as a weakness onto enemies, but generally speaking, they are both great, great options. Regarding Welt, in case you're wondering, he's typically someone who wants to use skill points, but you can run him in an Imbibitor Lune team. You would just want to be basic attacking more and using him mainly for his ultimate, which has a lot of damage and can also help you slow enemies while also making enemies take more damage. So a fine option, but not as optimal as an ability support like Peeler or Silverwolf, as the death shred they give you is massive. Now, before we talk about some other options you can run, I do want to mention that for your last slot, you typically want a skill point efficient healer or shielder. Someone like Luotra is typically just the best option. Japard is great too, and both of these work because they're very skill point efficient. Japard, first of all, is someone who shields with his ultimate and then doesn't really need to use his skill, so that can be enough to keep your team healthy. And then Luotra can heal you insane amounts without needing to use his skill. Like, it could be a cool emergency button if you need a lot of healing, but Luotra will automatically heal one of your party members if they ever get too low HP, and it'll also have a field that will heal all of your party members when you normal attack, which are two things that can happen without even needing skill points on top of having a strong skill if you need bonus healing. And so overall, Luotra and Japart are like the two best supportive options here or like defensive healer slash shielder options. But if you don't have them, it's fine. You can use either Natasha or Bailu. Just keep in mind that with both of these characters, they will need more skill points to actually be able to heal your team, making your rotations a bit tighter, but they will still work nonetheless. The same can be said about other shielders like the main character of March 7th. But in my experience with them, since their shield is not nearly as strong as Japart's, oftentimes having a healer can be a lot more comfy. And so generally, that's how you want to build and buy better Lune's teams with a general team comp looking like Ting Yun and then either Pila or Silverwolf, depending on who you have. And then a defensive option like Luocha, 
dodge apart or any other healer. And so overall, I really do love this new hyper carry DPS. And Bybiter Lune, one of my favorite design characters, but also very fun to use and very, very strong in my opinion. I hope I covered everything you need to know in this very detailed video. I do hope the length was appreciated though. That's why I add timestamps and go into so much depth. And I do want to apologize for the slight delay on the release of this video as I really wanted to test out everything. If there's anything new I want to add, since this character is new and new things are still being discovered, it will be in a pinned comment. So be sure to check that in case there are any changes. Hope the way it was worth it. And I hope you guys enjoyed this character as much as I do. And I hope that this video was helpful. Thanks so much for watching. And as always, I'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace.